Well, welcome and happy Memorial Day weekend, Pine Lake Church. Uh, it's good to be together today. I hope everyone has an awesome weekend plan with family and friends. Hey, if you have a Bible today, why don't you go ahead and open it up in the Old Testament to the book of Daniel. We're gonna be reading together through Daniel chapter one. So we'd love for you wherever you're at today, go ahead and open that up. You know, three to four weeks ago, I was able to go on a mission trip with a group of college students to the Dominican Republic. Specifically, we were in Barahona, Dominican Republic. It was a phenomenal week. We got to see God do powerful things. On the last day of that mission trip, uh, we went and we had what was called a fun day. And we got to go to the beach and got to go swimming in the Caribbean Sea. And our translator, Pastor Mishael, had even grabbed some goggles for us. So we were gonna get to go snorkeling out into the ocean, which if you know me, I love getting to do stuff like this. Now, before we were about to go Go run out into the crystal blue Caribbean Sea. He stopped us and he said, hey man, watch out for sea urchins. Now, I don't know what a sea urchin is. Maybe you know what a sea urchin is. He had told me that to watch out for these sea urchins. I thought it was like if somebody from the Dominican Republic had came to the States and we had said, hey, watch out for jellyfish, right? I'm like, okay, yeah, watch out for sea urchins. And then he goes on to tell me that they're poisonous. And I'm like, okay, yeah, we're gonna watch out for these sea urchins. He said they, they were these round, uh, looked like a ball and it had spiky edges on them. And so me and my buddy go out knowing, watch out for sea urchins. Now, the depth dropped really quickly as we were swimming, but the way the the ocean was set up as there were lots of large rocks as we were going out into the water. So the large rocks kind of became our rest stop. And so we went to this first large rock and found a place to stand. But by the time we hit the second large rock for our second rest stop to take a breather, my buddy had noticed that on these large rocks, they were infested with sea urchins. They were everywhere. And so we became very intentional that as we went from rock to rock, we were very careful with watching where we were going to stand because we didn't want to step on any sort of sea urchin. But it was hard once we got to our specific spot on this large rock because of the wave and the tides and the current. So we're, we're literally like these two idiot Americans out here on these large rocks. Like, how do we stay standing? We don't want to step on a sea urchin. It was hard. We had to stand firm and keep our feet planted. Maybe you've been in a similar, similar situation in life. For some of you growing up playing sports, maybe your coach was one of those coaches who would just grab your practice jersey and yank you back and forth across the court or the, the field that you were playing on. And more than anything, you would get frustrated and be like, I'm just gonna stand here. He's not gonna budge me and pull me any different direction. Maybe for some of my parents, um, it's beach season and you would try to get your family photo, but your little four-year-old will not stand still. And you're like, will you please, sweetheart, just stand here for just a moment, not move in any different direction. You know, I thought about that scene and that phrase, this idea of standing firm and keeping your feet planted and don't fall away. And I thought about what that looks like for the people of faith in Christ and living in our culture today that we live in a time where we are regularly invited to compromise in our walk with Jesus. We've become convinced, I believe, in our world that we should just keep our faith private. And we live in a world that is very bold in expressing its many beliefs, convictions, and personal truths. And yet we tend to see very few Christ followers who stand firm and stand up possibly for a fear of rejection, a fear of looking different, and because of a desire, I believe, to just look like everybody else. I love the way Pastor Tony Evans puts this idea of compromise. He says, compromise is the cancer of the church. We can't compromise on our faith principles. We can't be one way on Sunday and another way on Monday. This is a major problem in our world. We don't take a stand. We don't keep our standards. We merely just shift to satisfy society. You know, I just finished reading through the Gospel of John with a group of guys and over the last few months. And in John chapter 16, verse one, Jesus is talking to his disciples after helping them understand that, hey, if you follow me, as you guys surrender to me, it's not gonna be easy. And he's quoted saying this. He says, I say these things. Now, what are these things? These things where he had just told them that trouble was coming, that they were going to be hated that it would be hard. He says, I say these things to keep you from falling away. In other words, there's going to be this temptation to want to give in and stop fighting the good fight, to compromise, to go with the world. And I believe more than anything right now, Pine Lake family, there is a desperate need in our culture from followers of Jesus to stand firm in the faith no matter what our culture throws at us, to learn to live in it without becoming it, to learn to live in the culture without becoming like the culture, which I think leads me right back to our text in Daniel chapter one. 
The book of Daniel is the story of a young man and his three buddies who withstood throughout the stories and the, throughout what they walked through intense temptation. And they had more than a million reasons to give in and compromise on their faith time and time again. But what we find in Daniel and his buddies throughout this book are young men, young teenagers who stood firm when the culture around them, the influences above them, and the people they were doing life with were trying to pull them in a million different directions. They still had a faith that was unshakable. It couldn't be rattled. It couldn't comp they didn't compromise. So my Pine Lake family, today I wanna lock us in on how I believe these guys were able to fight, a f fight the good fight that I believe so many are losing today. They knew their identity, that they knew who they were because they knew whose they were. That the key for you and me to walk with an unshakable faith, a faith that doesn't compromise, that doesn't go with the culture, is to live in the unshakable identity that we have in Jesus Christ. So if you have your Bible, we're going to pick up in verse 1. It's going to be up on the screen. It says in verse 1, Daniel it says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, he came to Jerusalem and he besieged it. It says, and the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. It says, then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility. These were youth who were without blemish. They were of good appearance, and they were skillful in all wisdom. They were endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans or of the culture. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. And they were to be educated for three years. And at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. And then here comes Daniel and his three buddies into the story. It says, among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishal, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. He gave them new names. Daniel, he called Belshazzar. Hananiah, he called Shadrach. Mishal, he called Meshach. And Azariah, he called Abednego. And we'll land here in verse eight. It says, but Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. So what did we just read? Well, we read that in verse one, this king takes over. King Nebuchadnezzar has taken over Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar, he was evil, ungodly, and he was wicked. And what we know about Babylon during this time frame is that it was a huge city, almost like a metropolis. Historians believe it was the biggest city at the time, and there was somewhere between 150 to 200,000 people who were living in Babylon. And what Babylon would do is they would go in and they would conquer these foreign nations, and they would conquer their enemies, but what they didn't do is just obliterate them, right? They would actually harvest the best of the material and the human resources that the society had, and they would absorb it into their own society to make them better. I don't know about you, but that, that sounds like the plot line of every alien movie we've ever seen, right? The aliens are coming in, they're taking over, they're gonna harvest the best of the resources and try to fit it into their uh, culture, so the people that the Babylonians kept were the cream of the crop. They would pick these young teenagers who were the cream of the crop. So for you and me, that's the, you know, the princes, the studs, the, the AP track kids, right? The captains of the football team, the sharp teenagers. And in verse four, it tells us these were young men without blemish, of good appearance, skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace. And so these four guys... They're young teenagers, but they were the cream of the crop, so they were chosen. They were ripped from their families across the desert. Their entire future has been radically changed. And so for the next three years, we just read this, their entire future was going to be indoctrination into all things the Babylonian culture. It was almost like a complete brainwashing. And part of the brainwashing process, this is vitally important for us to begin to see together, is if you ship shift from verse four to verse seven, you'll see that part of the brainwashing process was a name change. So if you're taking notes today, maybe you wanna write this down, but the enemy in our life will flip the script, script in our life and seek to mess with our identity. You see, the first attack on the enemy on how to push these guys from who God wants them to be was a name change. 
And here's why. If you don't know your identity, and if you don't know who you are in Christ, the new name God has given you, you'll stand up to nothing. You have to know your name. You see, it's fascinating. Part of the process of the Babylonianization of the boys was to call them by names that glorified the idolatrous gods. The captors um, sought to, in effect, obliterate from their memory their original names. They were Hebrew names, all of which glorified the one true living God. Y'all, this happened to all four boys. This is fascinating. I want you to see this with me on the screen. For Daniel, his name meant God is my judge. His new name meant Bel protects his life. For Hananiah, his name meant Yahweh has been gracious. His new name, Shadrach, meant I am fearful of God. How about Meshach? His name meant who can compare to my God? No one. Meshach's name meant, his new name was I am despised, I'm contemptible, and I'm humiliated. Azariah's name meant Yahweh is my helper. He's my helper. Abednego's new, his new name, Abednego, meant the servant of Nebo. So what, what does this tell us today? As your list, what does this tell us? I think it tells us that when our culture continues to change, and it is, we must know who we are. They're inviting these four young teenagers to forget who they were and to consider the false narratives of the Babylonian gods to change the way they see themselves. And I would say to you today that this is the issue of the hour for every one of us in our walk with Jesus is do we know who we are? That when culture changes, when things change in your life, when following Jesus and claiming his as, as Lord doesn't become as normalized as it used to be, how do you respond? Everything has changed for these dudes. And so our identity is so critical in this journey with Jesus. How would you define your identity? What would be your definition for that? Well, 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 if somebody were to ask you, man, walking down the street, man, how would you define identity? I would say your identity is the narratives of what you think about yourself. And if you don't understand, understand the narratives that have informed the way you think, you'll never change the way you behave and see yourself. Growing up, my father was huge on this. We, when we were living in Brandon, Mississippi at the time, I was in kindergarten and first grade and he would take me to school at Rouse Elementary School. And every single day when he would drop me off, I would have to look back at him and say, I was taking two things with me. He'd say, Austin, who are you taking with you? And as a kindergarten and first grader, I'd get all excited and I'd say, all right, I'm taking Jesus and I'm taking Davis. I had to do this every single day as a kindergartner and first grader, but it didn't stop there. When I was in middle school and high school going to away basketball games or away baseball games or going to middle school dances, Austin, who are you taking with you? And then I'm kind of like, all right, dad, we're still doing it. Yes, who are you taking with you? And I have to say Jesus and Davis. Y'all, I was 18 years old going to senior prom, going to pick up my date for senior prom, walking out the door, Austin, who are you taking with you? And I have to look back at him and say, Jesus and Davis. And for me, it kind of became a joke. For him, it was a big deal. Why? He wanted me to understand my identity because he knew my identity would always give me strength and, and guidance in regard to the choices that I made wherever I went. And so I can say to you today that all of our identities have been formed by the narrative that we've allowed to speak into our life. And it's created in so many different ways. Through family, your upbringing, through coaches, through mentors, pastors in your life, no matter how young today or how old you are, the narrative you've allowed and allowed to speak into your life has shaped the way you see yourself. And that we also know underlying all of it in scripture, there's another voice in our lives. Come on, can we, can we be real today? It's called, called the enemy. Scripture says that he prowls around like a roaring lion. John 10, 10, Jesus talking about him says he's out to steal, to kill and destroy. And he is speaking lies. He's speaking destruction. And he's wanting to cause frustration, doubt and cause seeds of consistent insecurity in our lives. Now stay with me because here's why this is so important. It's because here's what I think we've probably all begun to learn over the years, that if we don't grab hold of the unhealthy, detrimental voices in our life, it doesn't matter how much belief in Jesus we have, doesn't matter how many times we try to go to church or try to check something religious off the list, we will not follow him in a culture that is always inviting us away from the truth of his word and who he is. We have to consider the narratives to walk with an unshakable faith and resting in our unshakable identity. The apostle Paul 
spoke brilliantly on this, I think, as he's writing to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5. Look at what Paul writes. He says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. What is Paul saying? He's saying we have to understand the false narratives in our life that are coming to us from our background, the enemy. For some of us, it's our past. And we have to take those thoughts captive and match it up in obedience to Christ, which I would say is his word. It's you choosing to listen to the voice of truth, the new name that God has given you. More than just a saving faith, when you stepped into a relationship with him, the new name he has given you versus the false voices, right? The voices from our past, from the enemy. And so here's what I wanna do over the next few moments together, Pine Lake family. Let's confront some false narratives. Some of you today, what have you been led to believe that isn't true, that isn't matched up with what God says about you? Let's confront some of those. Come on, what's, what's one false narrative? I think one false narrative is I... I must meet certain standards to feel good about myself. I'd call this one the performance trap. This is I've got to do something to be something. I've got to do something to be somebody. We all deal with this. Can I ask you a question? Who's Michael Jordan? I would hope you would say to that, um, he's the greatest basketball player of all time. Most of you would say Michael Jordan is a basketball player. Can I ask you a question? Who is Jennifer Aniston? Most of you would probably say, depending on the movie, she's a good actress. Look, if, I, if you had said Michael Jordan was a basketball player, Jennifer Aniston is an actress, you would be absolutely wrong for I wouldn't have told you who they were. I would have only told you what they do. And I think the greatest mistake in the world is for you to use your performance to give you your identity. The greatest mistake in our world is to define ourselves by what we do, and it, yet it's the way so many people define themselves today. Come on, what happens when guys get together, when men get together? If you walk into any sort of hangout with a group of guys, a group of men, what is the first thing we do in conversation? Hey, what's your name? What do you do for a living? And we all start sizing each other up as we start hearing about what they do for a living. And then we start assuming, okay, man, he seems like he makes a lot of money. He's the CEO of XYZ. He's got the successful um, family, wife. He's got the beach house in 30A. You know, we start saying, man, he must be somebody. We do this. What happens when women get together? Well, there's a constant measuring up that happens, right? Right? Are my kids accomplishing as much as hers? Or am I as successful as she is? Are my Facebook posts um, highlighting my kids, outpacing her Facebook posts, highlighting her kids? Come on, we live in this. It is always a misdefinition of ourselves when you put it in your performance and what you do. Because according to scripture, we have nothing to perform for. Which leads me to truth number one, to match up against false narrative number one. I am a child of God. You are a child of God. I love the way John writes about this in John chapter one, verse 12. Some of you just need to memorize this. He says, but to all who did receive him, all who believed in his name, everyone who has put belief and faith in Jesus, what he did at the cross, he says he gave them the right to become children of God. That's privilege, that's access, that's that's a positional verse. This is your position today. Galatians 3, 26, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. And we can rest in that. Today, there's nothing you have to do. There's nothing you have to achieve. There's nothing you have to perform for. God in Christ has made you fully alive in him. You are his son. You are his daughter. Not the amount of money you attain, the type of vacation you go on this summer, the particular amount of athletic ability your kids might have, or how put together you might think your marriage is. You are enough to him. You are his son, his daughter, and ain't nothing that's going to take that away from you when you step into relationship with Jesus. I think another narrative we might live in together is this idea of I have to be approved by others to feel good about myself. Come on, I call this one the approval trap. Come on, we got any any people pleasers listening today? Come on, I'm a people pleaser. I want you to like me. I want people to like me, but here's what you've probably begun to learn just as much as I have, is that if we get obsessed with only feeling good about ourselves when other people like us or when other people approve of us or when other people pat us on the back, we begin to totally forget that all that really matters is what God thinks about us. But we can fall into this narrative because it feels good. 
And it feels good to be liked by people. And it feels good to get an attaboy. And it feels good to be loved by the world, doesn't it? Come on, social media feeds this in our world today. Likes and comments on Instagram, Facebook. We live in this in our culture and we are chasing approval. And we're always looking at somebody else in comparison. It's why comparison has become such a battle in our world today. And can I tell you that comparison can become such a battle and it cripples the way that we see ourselves and it blinds us from the way God sees us. And if you were to continue to follow the story of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, man, we don't have time to today. But if you were to just continue to follow the narrative of what these guys walked through, you're gonna begin to see that they were looking for no one else's approval. They were living and working for an audience of one that their identity was connected to the truth that God is the only one that matters, that he fully approves of me. Look at how John puts it in 1 John 3, 1. He says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. Truth number two, I am totally loved, totally loved today. This is the only way I think we can begin to have strength to stand firm when it's difficult and stand unshakable is to be reminded that he loves us, that we are in Christ that God thought you were worth dying for, that he loves everything about you. Yes, you are his son and daughter, and that means you are totally loved. Whether or not no one else approves of you today, he says, I approve of you, you're fully loved. You know, I've been resting on this song by Maverick City Worship called Jehovah Jireh. I love this song. And the first lyric in this song is this idea of, I'll never be more loved than I am right now. I wasn't holding you up. So there's nothing I can do to let you down. Maybe somebody just needs to take a breather. You ain't holding him up today. You ain't holding God up today. He's holding you up and he's crazy about you. Every single part of you, even your imperfection and brokenness. Romans 5, 8 touches on that. It says, but God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That even in our brokenness, he still thought we were worth dying for. He went to the cross, called us fully accepted before him. You know, I got, to, and a lot of my background, I got to be a part of what uh, organization called FCA, and then I even got to be a part of an organization called Athletes in Action, um, which is aff affiliated with Campus Crusade. And Athletes in Action, they have this phrase that they do with a lot of college student athletes around the country, and it's this idea of AO1. And they, they help teach athletes who have kind of found their identity in the particular sport they play. They help teach them that, hey, it doesn't matter how many points you score. It doesn't matter what the whole world thinks about you, what they're tweeting about you. What matters is that you are playing for an audience of one. And so what happens is, man, athletes have grabbed hold of this idea and you'll see them write it on their basketball shoes or when they're going to play baseball, they'll put it on their tape, A01. It's this idea that, man, I'm, I'm working, I'm playing, I'm competing for an audience of one to give him glory. That's it. He approves of me. He says I'm enough. And I think about this idea for us, when we realize that we are living, working, and performing for an audience of one and from a place of complete approval from the God of the cosmos, man, that's a game changer. That's a perspective shift in our life. You're totally loved. I think some of you today, though, you might not be able to even lean into that because you've fallen into false narrative number three, which is I'm unworthy of love and I deserve to be punished. Man, I, I call this one the shame narrative. This is the shame trap. This is the man I, I get. I know what Jesus has done for me. I know what he's given me in my life. But Austin, man, you don't understand. This is the guilt narrative that comes every time God is trying to set you free. Every time God is trying to call you to more, the enemy is whispering lies and telling you who you're not. Man, you can't believe any of this stuff. This ain't true. And can I tell you today, the enemy might be doing it right now, right? You're listening to some truth spoken over you from God's word, but the enemy saying, bro, this is for everybody else but you. Nobody else has walked through what you've been walking through. Nobody else has the track record that you have. It ain't for you. And can, I, can, 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 we, can we just preach some truth to each other today? My friends, truth number three, you are fully forgiven. My friends, this is why Jesus went to the cross so that you don't have to live in the shame narrative anymore. Colossians chapter one, verses 19 through 22 says, for in him, talking about Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled. Look at this language. He is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless 
before him. Above reproach before him. Y'all, this is awesome. What, what, what Paul is writing here is that the moment you and me repent, when we turn from our brokenness, admit our brokenness, admit our imperfection, when we confess belief in Jesus and the cross, this is the moment that he presents us holy and blameless before him fully forgiven. I mean, that's worth the party. Worth the party bigger than Saturday in the junction or at the Grove. I mean, that's worth the party. I'm gonna pause right here. Maybe you're listening today and you've never stepped into a saving faith relationship with Jesus Christ. Man, we'd love to have a conversation with you about that. You can step and stand in your new identity today for the first time. If you text Jesus to 57555, then we'll have somebody reach out to you right now and they wanna have a conversation with you about what it looks like to step into your new name that he wants to give you today. He wants to call you his son. He wants to call you his daughter. In Christ, we are fully forgiven. The blood of Christ on the cross has fully forgiven you. I love the way the psalmist puts it in Psalm 86, five. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. I love the way uh, Pastor Louis Giglio, I think he says it best when he talks about the enemy trying to bring up some junk in our past. He says the enemy trying to bring up your past to condemn you is like somebody robbing you of your old house. Man, you don't live there anymore. That ain't your stuff. So why should we consider the past when Christ doesn't? My friends, these are our truths today. These are the truths that we can match up against the false narratives that we've been led to believe that in Christ, man, you're a child of God. You are totally loved. You're fully forgiven. And if we were to continue, again, I, don't, I told you we don't have the time, but if we were to continue in the story of Daniel, in Daniel chapter three, we'll see that his three buddies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are willing to go into a fiery furnace before dishonoring God and compromising on their faith. And you flip three chapters over to Daniel chapter six, we'll learn that Daniel is willing to be thrown into a, 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 a lion's den with ferocious lions before dishonoring God and compromising on his faith in Jesus, you see, even with the name change, they refused to let the culture define them. Yahweh defined who they were. So today, can you let him do the same in your life, wherever you're listening at today? I mean, but here's the reality, man. This might be some good truth, but this is hard living because tomorrow's coming and the enemy is knocking at your door. So how do we do this? What does this look like? Practically, how do I do this in my life, Austin? How do I shut out these voices, tune into God's voice? I think it's a practical way is what we just, what I wanna talk about is this idea of tuning out and tuning in. It's learning how to tune out to the false voices and what the enemy is trying to tell us and tune into what God is saying to us. But the problem for a lot of us is our lives are too loud. You know, I go work out at a local um, gym in Starkville and part of uh, at the workout facility is I, I go in with my little Beats headphones and I'll go do a little workout, weightlifting and always run on the treadmill. But when I first started working out on this workout facility, I got frustrated because my um, headphones were often drowned out by the loudspeakers. And I had a playlist that I roll with, right? I, I listened to Rascal Flats and Elevation Worship. Now don't judge me, okay? My boys hate on me about this, but when you're, when you're a runner like me, when you get on mile four, Rascal Flats and life is the highway, it just kind of makes me go. And so that's my go-to, but these loudspeakers would be drowned out by my headphones and it was so frustrating because it was like some metallic stuff. And I think about in our life, this is what happens in our lives, isn't it? That the voice of the Holy Spirit, God is trying to speak and minister to us every single day, but our lives are too loud. And we allow all our culture, these false voices, the enemy to just eat our lunch every single day. We can't allow the false voices to drown out the voice of truth. We have to learn how to turn up and tune into his voice. And what you feed and what you listen to will lead to what you believe to be true about yourself. And so come on, Pine Lake family, we're heading into this summer. This summer, can you create space for his voice? Can you create space for his voice? I think we often just create little space for his voice. Can you create space for God this summer? There's no space you can't open up for God that he won't fill. Mark chapter four, Jesus says this, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and still more will be added to you. It's this idea that as you continue to create more space for God, man, he's gonna fill up more space in your life and continue to reveal more of who he is. Can you create space for him? Two simple ways we can do that in our lives. For you this summer, practically, man, his word is a way to create space for his voice to fill you up. God's word. 
His word is active, it's alive. It's why in our culture, at, Pine, at a part of our Pine Lake family, when we're gonna preach the L3, we're gonna tell you about the L3 because we believe that to win the battle of your mind, you have to fill your mind with God's word. You have to, you have to allow God's word to permeate your soul every single day so God can minister to you through that. One of my favorite things I get to do when I hang out with college students up in Starkville is when I get, go get coffee with one of them and I start having a conversation with them and one of them I just ask, man, how, what's God teaching you in his word? And when somebody immediately just comes back at me, man, I was reading yesterday in 1 Corinthians and I'm like, man, that's awesome. It just fills me up because I know, man, they're moving to a place where they're living from their identity, not for it, because God has been ministering to them through, their word, through his word. So first way is I think through his word. Secondly, man, through his people. I mean, do you have people in your life right now who speak God's truth over you? Not their opinions, but God's word and God's truth when you're walking through those difficult seasons. It's funny, we're very intentional with middle school and high school students and college students about saying, man, you're the sum of the five people you hang out with, right? Keep an eye on the company that you keep. But as we begin to grow up and start a family, what happens in our lives is we just kind of naturally start hanging out with the people we do life with. Maybe it's not people at church, but it's people at the country club, at the golf course, who we go to ball games with. So can I ask you a question today? Are the people who are in your corner, in your life, are these people who, when you are walking through that season, when the enemy is just eating your lunch, are these people who can speak truth and life and God's word over you? God uses people like that to minister through his word and through his people This is why we love for you to tune in to us online and join us for worship on a Sunday morning so that you can move to a place where you're living from your identity, not for it. It starts right here. So can I ask you just one more question? Look, what have you been listening to? What false narrative has taken your heart captive today? And you know, I'm with you on this. Ministers and pastors, man, we live in the same boat that you're in. And the enemy tries to come at me in all kinds of different ways throughout my life. I remember a little over a year ago, right before COVID hit, um, God was moving in powerful ways in our college ministry up there in Starkville. And it was awesome to see students coming and we were excited about it. And there was one particular night when we were kicking off a relationship series. And if you know anything about college students, when you kick off a relationship series, man, the people just show up, right? They want to have all the answers about dating and, and, and all that good stuff. So, man, we, had, we, had all, we, we were expecting a good crowd. And I, we had a baptism that night, so I baptized somebody. And I was kind of back in the back hallway getting ready to come up and preach on uh, singleness. And, man, how God, how God calls it a gift. And Paul writes about it being a gift. And so I'm back there in this back hallway hallway, kind of doing all the things I normally do. I'm looking over my outline, you know, praying Psalms 19, 14, may the meditation of my heart, the words of my mouth, Lord, saying all the right things, God, I'm going to hide behind the cross. And then I had a buddy come running down the hallway. This is about five minutes before our last worship song. He comes running down the hallway, Austin, Austin, Austin. I'm like, what's up, man? He's like, dude, you need to tell every guy to stand up and let the girls come sit down. I'm like, what? He's like, dude, there's like 150 people standing up. You know, college guys, they get all excited. It's like 150 people standing right now. And so we like dap each other up. I'm like, got it, got it. And so he runs off and get all excited for about 20 seconds. And then the enemy just starts eating my lunch. And he starts saying, man, Austin, I don't know why you're the one preaching tonight. Man, you ain't, you ain't enough. Man, you know what you were doing in college? You weren't even good at dating in college. Start saying all these lies, whispering all these lies. And for the next three to four minutes, man, it was a torment back there in that back hallway. I'll never forget it. I was not ready to go up and communicate God's word to these students, the word that he had given me. I was not ready to hide behind the cross. I was, man, almost literally suffering back there. And then something shifted about literally right as I'm about to go up, I felt the Lord bring me back to what I had read this morning. Praise the Lord for L3. And it just so happens that I had been reading through the book of Esther. Just the way God works. That morning had literally been Esther chapter four. When Esther is called to take a huge step of faith and Mordecai comes to her her and says, look, maybe you were here for such a time as this. And in that moment, look, I don't ever acknowledge that God speaks to me audibly, but in that moment, I just felt the overwhelming sense of his voice and his presence saying, man, you're here for such a time as this. I want you to be the one who brings my truth and shares my gospel and my love for people. And I just rested in that. Never forget that moment. That night I went, and I remember after that night, I was so comfortable up there communicating. I was talking to my wife, just crying over how God had ministered to me in that moment. And I share that with you, not to give myself a pat on the back, to say, man, we're all in this together. It's us every day learning how to shut out the, the voice of the enemy, tune into what God is saying to us, what he wants to say 
to us. So my Pine Lake family, man, what, what false narrative has taken your heart captive today? Can we be a family who walks with an unwavering, uncompromising faith because we know who we are, because we know who we are? So I'd love to just for a moment pray for us. And I don't know where you're at. Maybe you're in your car. Maybe you're listening on a couch with your family right now, but I'd love to just voice a prayer over us. And so wherever you're at, man, could you just close your eyes, bow your head? And just, just where you're at, could you just, man, start allowing God to minister to you? What, what false narrative has taken your heart captive today? Man, what has God been saying to you? What has the enemy been saying to you? How's he been eating your lunch lately? Has he been telling you you're not good enough? Has he been telling you that you ain't loved? Has he been bringing up your past time and time again? What false narrative have you let take over your heart and your life today? And now can you allow God to minister to you that you're a child of God, that you are totally loved, you're fully forgiven. Can you rest in those truths today? Come on, can we allow God to minister to us today? Maybe in this moment, you need to talk to somebody. You need somebody to pray with you. And you've stepped in, uh, into a saving faith with Jesus, but man, <laughs> the enemy's eating your lunch right now. Can you text pray to 57555? Maybe again, God's inviting you to step into a relationship with him for the first time. You understand that your shame doesn't have to define you anymore. Your past doesn't have to define you anymore. When you repent, turn from your own way, step into a relationship with him, put your belief in him. Man, he calls you his son, his daughter. That's your, that could be your position today. Can you text Jesus to 57555? Man, Jesus, we love you. And God, we bless you. God, we trust you. God, we all are thankful today that we can rest in our identity because our identity comes from you, not from the world, not from what our culture says to us, not from what we achieve, not from what we do, God, but it comes from the, the standing and the position that we have in you. Thankful that you call us today your son, your daughter, totally loved, fully forgiven, God. We rest in who you are today. You are good, you are faithful God, we're gonna sing about how, Lord, we need to rest in who you say we are. Lord, I pray you minister to us through that, God, that we're gonna rest in who you say we are. Not what the world says, not what the culture says, not what the enemy's trying to tell us, God, but who you say we are. God, we love you, we trust you, amen.